trying to get back to the basics of great products. Power comes from sharing information. I try to convince people to slow down. Free. Yeah. Open. This is the Soak by Smush Podcast. Hi everyone and welcome to a yet another episode of the Soaked by Slush podcast. My name is William von der Palen and with me, as usual, in Copenhagen is Isa Krautio. Hi Isak, how are you? Hello listeners and how William, how are you doing? I'm great, thanks. Hey, in, in this uh, episode we have, a, we have an exciting guest. We have Mariam Gulumian. Is that how I say it? I practiced it a bit before the episode, but how do you... How, how do you sure. What grade do I get? Mariam Gulumian. Nice. Perfect. Welcome to the Soak by Slush podcast. Hello. I'm very happy to be your guest now. So, could you give a short introduction of yourself and and uh, what sort of what made us ask you to come to this podcast? Your sort of founding founder history. Sure. Um, so I have um, I have been born in a, let's say an average Armenian uh, family. Um, school, high school, then bachelor's in business in the American University of Armenia. And uh, afterwards, but actually in between uh, the American University of uh, Armenia, I just took a, a gap year and went to Drip University uh, to the HERO uh, program there for about five weeks, you know, in the Silicon Valley. Um, and during the, maybe the first, yeah, it was the first year of, the, uh, of my university year that I had, uh, that I actually learned to even w- the word startup and what it means. Let's say it was very, very new to me and the startup ecosystem just got involved in it. I had my idea, um, during my first startup idea, I just collected my team. And that's why I also went to the drip a university, um, to Silicon Valley, where I also pitched my idea. You know, I had my, you know first team, MVP, whatever, and then it kind of failed and then started like a carrot. I came back from the Draper University and worked on my first startup. And then I knew that it was, it was like, a you know, you kind of felt that it was going about to fail that. And then we started with our team, uh, Lucky Carrot, which is totally another story. And we have been working on Lucky Carrot uh, since uh, 2018, November, December. That's when the idea just generated. And exactly like 2018 fall, I just came back from the JP University. So this is kind of my story regarding uh, the startup ecosystem, my involvement in it. Cool. Yeah, we're probably going to talk about Lucky Carrot in this episode quite a lot. But can you can you bring us back to that moment when you went to Silicon Valley for the first time and mm-hmm. this whole new world opened up for you? Like, I'm assuming that this is not really a scene that's that big in Armenia, based on what you're saying, that it's it, all of this was new. And can you sort of describe that feeling and what you learned? Sure. Um, so uh, I learned about a Drip University from one Armenian who was the only one and the very first one participating in a Drip University. And uh, after participating, he came back to Armenia and he founded here a Hero House, you know, Hero House um, uh, startup incubation program. He even started, you know, the venture fund, uh, working with, uh, you know, Draper Fund. Um, and that's how I started learning about Draper. And this is the kind of, this is the person, his name is Humbertsum. And uh, exactly from Humbertsum, I learned about what startup is in my first year during dur- during the bachelor's degree in, uh, in my university. And then I, after learning about it, I just went there and it was um I mean, it was, I, I've learned a lot, you know, I had learned a lot before going to Silicon Valley, everything about it. And uh, my expectations about it, it was like met, you know, mm. and uh, for five weeks, we um, got to know a lot of people there, you know, a lot of um, people that came from a very big, you know, companies as mentors, right. And then, you know, learning you how to pitch your idea, right. And then we went to, um, uh, learn about the Silicon Valley culture and, you know, TEDx in the scope of TEDx in San Francisco. So everything like, you know, a bunch of emotions just came into, but they were something that I expected to happen. And, uh, what is, uh, kind of the, the state of the startup ecosystem in Armenia at the moment? Is it, uh, you know, is it usual to have your own company? Is it something that's building up slowly? Is it something, yeah. What, what does it look like at the moment? Mm-hmm. Um, in Armenia, it is still, of course, developing. Um, 
it's not as you know developed of course as you know silicon valley or maybe let's say you know other parts of the us or even like europe um but we do have very successful startups that are you know um raising millions of you know dollars in rounds um but it's still kind of you know it it still hasn't gone to its you know peak it's growing very very fast because lots of new startups are you know right rising um, mostly from, you know, university guys and a lot of people from even, uh, you know, after the age of, you know, 30 or 40 has started, you know, have started um, being very active in the startup ecosystem. So it's still rising. Uh, I mean, I know I'm sure that we can do a lot, lot, lot better than we are doing right now. But the thing is that also from the government, I, we see that we are getting lots of support, right? Still, we didn't have as many projects or programs for Armenian startups in different, in different many ways. I know maybe it is um, helping you to go to conferences because usually startups don't have those, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars to go to conferences, let's say outside Armenia, right? And to see the world outside Armenia, what's happening there. Because if you have a startup and you want to go to US or Europe and sell there, uh, that's one of the problems actually that uh, maybe Armenians are tackling with so that you look at the problem in within only the scope of Armenia. So you need to go outside to see what's happening outside. Is the problem that you are defining to solve with your startup, is it really the problem for, you know, people that are living abroad or not? Um, so, you know, government is supporting with, with, you know, grants, with programs that can participate and, you know, have a grant. Uh, even during this COVID, we have lots of, uh, you know, programs for um, startups or small sized businesses. And so the government uh, in parallel with, you know, entrepreneurs rising and still, you know, going in parallel together, they're rising. Do you see the scene sort of growing year by year? I mean, you seem like you're, you're, I mean, you're a young entrepreneur in Armenia right now. You're sort of riding that wave kind of, uh, of, of the, the scene riding. Have you, have you seen a change within the coming years and how do you see it developing in the, in the following years? In the near future. Uh, so the question is, um, you know, people becoming entrepreneurs in a very young age. Is that the question? Uh, the question is kind of how do you see this uh, this Armenian startup scene developing, or just the entrepreneurial atmosphere developing? Mm -hmm. You're seeing it's it's on the rise right now. You're kind of riding that wave as a young entrepreneur in Armenia yourself. Okay, got it. Um, so I'm very, very, very positive and optimistic about what's happening right now and what ha what has been happening, you know, in a pa uh, what was happening in the past years and what is happening right now. And I'm very, very positive and optimistic for the future because uh, we have like um, sometimes you just sit there and uh, you get uh, an email from a local um, venture funds or from you know, a local um, newsletters and you start up. Let's say it can be even an Armenian startup based in, let's say, LA. And we had we just had this case a few days ago. I just learned about a new Armenian startup from LA just raising, I think it's more like $5.4 million. So you get lots of, you know, uh, interesting news. It's not really about Armenians being in Armenia doing entrepreneurship. It's also Armenians about outside, you know, Armenian diaspora that you learn about their entrepreneurial, you know, progression. Um, and yeah, regarding, um, let's say, young entrepreneurs, I'm very happy to see them, but I'm actually more, you know, I'm very, you know, I get happier when I see entrepreneurs that are, you know, kind of older, let's say much, much older than us. It's very, very promising. They are not stuck in the, you know, traditional ways of doing you know, small business or not taking risks. Um, these people that are old, they start learning about, again, as I was learning what the startup is or what's um, the, you know, subtleties about, you know, fundraising, what that even is, because uh, in Armenia, and again, that's one of the problems that Armenia has regarding the startup ecosystem, being in Armenia and not seeing what's happening in the world, mm. that's one. And second of all, um, in the U.S., it's very, very famous to um, do the first funding uh, from your family or even from your grandma. But it's not the case, of course, in Armenia, because your grandma in Armenia does not have, you know, shares or, I don't know, some stocks from Google. So Armenians are not, you know, uh, very, you know, familiar with it, right? And so you're kind of investing money in 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 a company. That's one of the, you know, problems regarding Armenia that you are sorry you can't really raise lots of lots of money from your grandmas or your families. So you kind of need to go exactly to um, either your savings if you're old enough and you have those savings, or you can go to um, angel investors, which is again kind of something that is rising 
in Armenia. It's not there, you know, it hasn't been there for years and very mature. Like even Armenian angel investors, they're still learning. They are also on their way to learning from uh, international uh, angel investors. But this learning curve is like like this. I know it's going very up, very, very yeah, exactly. And and as the startup ecosystem evolves, uh, the capital streams tend to to evolve as well. And and also, you know, a few success stories usually breed more more capital into the whole country and creates this positive loop effect. But but how have you uh, experienced? Uh, have you done fundraising with with your company? And and how? Yeah. What what would you say? Uh, at what level are are VCs are, are European VCs looking at Eastern Europe enough? Because we've had some discussions with with the European Investment Bank and, and venture capitalists overall, where where we find that Eastern Europe t- tends to to be, you know, in the in the bigger picture, uh, still a bit neglected uh, compared to to many other parts of Europe, for instance. Mm-hmm. So, um, regard, yeah, we did fundraising. Uh, we did preset. Uh, uh, we did a preset uh, from local angel investors. Um, and we will be doing a next round of, you know, by Q2 next year, Q2, like to Q2 or Q3, 2021. So we need to close by then, uh, the, the seed round. Um, if I tell you like the story behind Lucky Care, you will get the idea of yeah. what was happening yeah. regarding this, let's say needing the money from, you know, family members or whatever. So you, you will catch that. Um, with uh, most of my co-founders and most of my team members, we were working at one of the very prominent local tech companies here in Armenia. And this tech company has been around for more than 10 years, actually having lots of different products in UK, Ireland, US. Um, and uh, as a tech company, we had a financial reward, you know, financial bad budget that we were giving to the employee of the month uh, on a monthly basis. And how we were doing this, um, we had Slack channel as a main communication channel, you know, as a tech company. And that Slack channel, we were nominating our colleagues to become the employee of the month. So, for example, I can say, um, I nominate William to become the employee of the month for this or that reasons. Yes. Yeah. And then, I vote for William. <laughs> but let's say Isaac is also nominated. And then we're competing but, now. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, so let's say there are like 10 nominants. Um, yeah. And then the management would choose one of these 10 nominants to become the employee of the month, right? So let's say Isaac is being nominated, Isaac is being the employee of the month, Isaac is chosen, right? And so we were we were doing this for uh, for a few months, and we thought that this is going to increase what is being called employee engagement. And it's it's not the same as motivation. Motivation is like the tip of the iceberg. There is this term which is very, very um, you know, trendy, it's becoming trendy in HR. Most of right now in the U.S., but it's becoming kind of trending in other parts of the world too. So this there is you know deeper something you know much much deeper than employee motivation, which is employee engagement. And we were we wanted to raise employee engagement. In basic basic terms, employee engagement is that uh, the employee when the employee is engaged, the employee will has a very strong emotional commitment to team's goals, to company's mission, and is bringing his or her best self to uh, the company. So the employee, when he or she goes home, is not saying, okay, so I just forget about the company, what has been his or her tasks. The company is, the, the employee is willing to go the extra mile for the company. And so um, we wanted to, you know, increase this employee, what we call employee engagement. And uh, we brought recognition, this recognition program through uh, employee of the month, um, tradition and one uh, so exactly one of the factors that increases employee engagement is the recognition millions of reasons millions of things that you can do to increase engagement one of the top ones is recognition second of all is the growth the growth of the employee personal and professional right so for example um does your uh, day look like the same as it was like six months ago have you increased your um, skills or whatever, or does the company use, uh, does the company use your skills or potential or first of all recognizes it then use them? So we wanted to increase this employee engagement, but actually maybe the, like um, the vice versa happened. So because you had only one happy person, one employee of the month, right, who was getting all of the claps, 
all the good stuff, the financial reward, the moral, you know, uh, incentives, whatever. And then you have lots of other people that were, um, and we knew they were doing something great every day, small or big achievement, but they were now being recognized. They were now being, they were now being rewarded financially, right? And so you had one happy person, one engaged people, one engaged person, a lot of unhappy people, especially when you become nominated and not being chosen for a few months in a row, that's even worse. So we did a, so we wanted to uh, find a solution. We did a hackathon, a 24 hour hackathon inside our company and lots of, you know, ideas generated. And one of them was like a carrot. And then like a carrot won because, you know, we had a jury uh, uh, comprised of you know, the management and employees and like a carrot won. And then our company became our very first paying client. And then uh, kind of it took off from there. So Lucky Carrot became Lucky Carrot. It started, you know, being a separate company with our team, being incorporated. And uh, since we were a tech company, first of all, we had the developmental resources to build the platform. So you did not need that time to have to fundraise to keep your employees with you so that they can develop the the platform. So this uh, also answers your question, William. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just want to say for the record, if it's between me and William who wins Employer of the Month, I never win, and that wouldn't do good for my uh, motivation. <laughs> so you're right. Don't bring it's yourself a, down. But uh, <laughs> I think, no, but I think that's a really interesting idea in many ways because you're right. And what tends to happen, at least in my experience, that it, it gets even worse. You know, uh, employees tend to uh, agree before the vote you know, amongst themselves, who are they going to vote for? And they're going to, you know, look mm. through many months that, that it's evenly distrib- distributed. And, you know, that kind of, yeah, that ruins the whole point of, of any any <laughs> any stuff like this. And and as you said, you know, great things happen uh, every day in, in every company. And it's, uh, that will just create a big contrast between between people. So it's it's an, it's an a very interesting, p- like, idea. And, and I, I love the name as well. So, so it's uh, it's it's uh, it's very interesting and intriguing in many ways. But uh, what is kind of your uh, business model? How do you how do you you know sell this? And what's the yeah? How do you make make some money as well along the way so you can stay in business? Sure. Um, so uh, there are two revenue channels, and one is being applied for the second one. We need some time. Uh, the first revenue channel is the subscription model. So Lucky Carrot is working on, Lucky Carrot is like a software as, um, uh, it is a SaaS, right? And, um, uh, it is, they, uh, the companies pay us per user per month. So for example, if you're, if it, uh, uh, if there are, let's say hundred employees at your company, so the revenue, the service people for Lucky Carrot will be hundred times two and a half dollars because it's two and a half dollars per employee per month. Um, regarding the second revenue channel is the following. Um, in Like a Carrot, uh, since uh, we have brought uh, what we call like a decentralized approach of recognition, which is in other words, very famous when people say peer-to-peer recognition, which means Like a Carrot provides a platform where uh, employees can send virtual carrots to each other and speak about, uh, say thank you to their colleagues and speak about their small and big daily achievements that will be, you know, invisible if you are an HR sitting in your company or your CEO sitting your, you know, sitting in your office, especially with bigger companies like having hundreds of thousands of employees. And when employ and this carrots, they carry financial value. And since they, you know, do this carrot circulation, so for example, uh, I get carrots from my peers. It has um, financial value. I can exchange my collected carrots with local, uh, you know, branded gift cards or activities on Lucky Carrot platform. And this is where the second revenue channel comes from. Uh, after having enough user base, Lucky Carrot will be, you know, taking a commission from this gift card provider since we also bring them, you know, leads and clients. All right. Yeah, I understand. That sounds uh, sounds interesting. And and are you targeting mostly you know big bigger companies where this might be a bit more of an issue than in four or five people companies where it's should in theory at least be pretty pretty easy to thank people face to face. So I, I guess you're you're targeting the the bigger corporations. Um, in the very early stages, um, we um a little bit safe 
uh, we were like a little bit safety. So we were talking with companies that were like 20 employees, you know, 15 employees or 30 employees. But these companies, and then you just know, these are not the companies in our, what we call ICP, uh, ideal customer profile. Um, our ICP starts from like 50 employees and then up until uh, 5,000 employees. Uh, and the industries are mainly tech companies, uh, digital marketing agencies and finance companies, including banks. So, and when we were like talking about Silicon Valley, Lucky Carrot is something that brings, um, let's say a, a, a bank in, I don't know, Oman, let's say, Lucky Carrot brings a Silicon Valley culture to that bank that can be located in Oman, let's say. Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, what are your main markets? Uh, you know, is as you said, uh, this is something that maybe is being developed also in, in, in Silicon Valley, or this is something that we're waking up to and, and this whole employee and engagement mm -hmm. uh, part of HR. So are you targeting mainly markets close to, to home or and your home market, or are you going also towards the US and European markets or how are you looking at that? Mm -hmm. um, we were, uh absolutely on a very first stage we were talking to only armenian uh companies we were learning we were in trying to understand still who our ideal customer profile is what their pain is according to them like how do they pronounce their pain how do they see the solution to their pain are they solving so all of that uh, to understand all of this we were focusing on the armenian local you know companies Especially when, as I said, we were working at a local tech company. We were actually we had offices in a in a building, but had lots of other offices next to us, like neighbors. Just learn learn about Lucky Carrot, and then yeah, we wanted we wanted like, learn more marketing in tech companies, and they were small, and they were yeah they were Armenian companies. Um, but now and then like of course we when we start talking about already going international, um, we didn't focus on the U.S. Because, I mean, if you're a startup, and of course, yeah, U.S. market is very big. I mean, U.S. is not the only, you know, big market there on this, you know, big, you know, map, right? I mean, you don't necessarily need to go there or put in your pitch deck so that it will be very attractive and very hot for, you know, investors. Um, we focused on some other things. First, um, we uh, looked at the Baltics. And especially like Estonia, Lithuania, uh, Latvia, and um, UAE, United Arab Emirates. We see these two markets that we want to enter, and they're very, very interesting markets. There are reasons why. Uh, UAE, uh, we have we have been there, and we have seen their really, really great thank you culture. I mean, this is something that also like a care brings, right? Thank you culture, because if you have a platform where you recognize and thank you to your peers. And in UAE, if they have that culture and uh, when they hear, you know, there is a way to digitalize it and then have lots of analytics from, from it, like a care provides to HR managers and CEOs, right? To make you know, decision-making based on the real-time data generated by their employees and have a full visibility into employee interactions, company culture, employee engagement, whatever, just sitting at home and or in their offices, it, it, it seems very attractive. Why Baltics? Because we have, since um, our um, main, you know, client base is comprised from the you know, tech companies, and we work mainly with tech companies. Uh, the tech um, sector in, um, you know, tech companies in Estonia growing very rapidly, especially companies with more innovative and startupish culture. It might not be. It can be like even a bank, or it can be uh, a digital marketing agency, but they can have a very, you know, startupish and very innovative culture it can be like even an insurance company and we've seen there and we've seen this trend in, in Baltics that's why we right now target these two um uh, regions for for like two years for next two years maybe or even more okay I have a I have a question uh, you said something very interesting about the thank you culture would you say that before I even go to the two-part question I have would you agree uh, that Lucky Carrot is, is in some sense like a culture shaping tool in that sense within a yes so my question is how do you go about uh, building this type of tool that's involved in 
I mean, it's a, it's a very complex thing, organizational culture, human temperament, human personality, uh, psychology, all of these complex things that happens within every individual, and then put these individuals together who are there to do uh, tasks to, for a single goal, and try to have them work together. So my two-part question is, how do you go about building this uh, and sort of... Sort of uh, uh, make something concrete out of these insights you have? And then secondly, how do you know it's working? Mm -hmm. So first of all, it's very, very important to know the company that you're working with. You can uh, understand what's happening in the company when you go uh, in, in Armenia, as you know, in, in Armenia, it's very easy to find someone inside the company that is, you know, very close to you. And you can get information from there, like what's happening there. And it's very important that Lucky Fair does not enter uh, a company that where there is like a you know bad culture or let's say toxic, you know, toxic culture that can, that HR managers usually call it. Um, but regarding international companies, when you like talk to the HR team members, like you know, you have a big meeting with you know HRs that I don't know, a company that has let's say five HRs. You meet them, you meet with the senior management, kind of get the idea of what's happening inside. You learn about their processes, we'll learn about if they have like employee engagement as the senior management's KPI, or if they know what employee engagement is, or if they, you might not even know the term, it doesn't necessarily mean that, but maybe you have done something towards it, right? You get the idea of the, you know, um, intelligence regarding employee engagement at that company. And then, um, it's very important to enter like with like a carrot uh, into a company with a very very you know strong and right foundation because we do trainings of employees how to use like a carrot in the right way right uh, not just you know sending a carrot on the platform to you and saying hey thank you for for your help I mean it's it's not enough it's absolutely yeah. not enough and because like a carrot there is input and output meaning employees input the data so that. You know, there is a good output for the HR managers and senior management for good data. So there needs to be, there must be a good usage of the platform for which we do the training. And then when we like close the deal with the company, it's not, you know, it's not the end. We have a dedicated account management team that works with them, you know, collects feedback from them, has maybe calls with the HR managers once in two months or once in a month. It depends on the company size and some other specificities. And then you learn what's happening there. You get track of the, you know, the quality usage inside, the, the usage quality inside that company, right? So um, regarding the KPIs, let's say, and whether we know it works, um, is since we have like a team that uh, connects with the HR managers to get feedback from them, of course, you can get two types of feedback, you know, quantitative and qualitative. Uh, when we start working with the company for the quantitative feedback to get from there, uh, we have an engagement survey inside the Lucky Carrot that exactly not only measures engagement at your company, exactly with, you know, with a score, but it also measures the composites of engagement, what we call key metrics inside a platform. In simpler words, for your employee to be or stay engaged at your company, which means if the employee is engaged, will stay with will stay with you longer and will drive profitability of your company and lots of other business outcomes for you that will be very um, advantageous as a company. It is the uh, relationship with peers, relationship with the managers. It is about ambassadorship, how proud the employee is to be part of your company. It is about feedback. It is the company open to receive feedback from employees? It's about uh, alignment. Is the company is the employee uh, aligned with your company vision, mission, or values. And we have like 10 key metrics that we measure at the company. And we and this is like the baseline. When we work with the company, we do this survey to understand where the company is right now, for it to be clear for the company and for us. And then after using Lucky Carrot, what changes there are, right? In the baseline, you understand as a company what your top uh, strongest metrics are of employee engagement. What your two weakest metrics on employee of employee engagement? Start working with like a carrot, and then you get feedback after, let's say, two months or three months. It's different. It's very individual with companies to understand it has uh, your weakness improved or not. You as an HR manager, what have you done for it? Because like a carrot shows you your parts that you need to improve and your strong parts. Yeah. So you're basically, you know. Uh not tailoring the product, but then tailoring the amount of uh, 
you know, training and and also what kind of data the, the companies need to get out of it? Or do you also tailor the, the product itself uh, based on, on different customers? Or can you basically deploy the same product to basically anyone in, in terms of the technical product? Uh, so the question is like how customizable the platform is. Do I understand correctly? Yeah, or rather, do you like need to customize it a lot technically? Do you need to? Can you can you scale the product basically between companies and then rather more alter the the amount of training and you know uh, training and the, the other processes? Uh, uh, yeah, rather than the product. Uh, basically, yeah. When we were. Um, uh, developing like a carrot, of course, inside the team, like we had developers and like none of us was an HR manager and like a carrot is an HR you know, tool. So we needed to have you know, HR business partner inside, you know, inside like a carrot and plus to work with not only local HR managers, which is important because we knew like, like a carrot was, go- was going to be you know, international. We also have you know, international HR experts to work with us. And uh, a core, you know, uh, uh, their feedback really helped us to understand that from very first, you know, foundation of developing the, you know, product technically, it had to be very customizable in many different ways. And lack of care is very customizable. And for, for, for example, just to give you an idea uh, of that, um, right now, um, we are, when working with companies, they even use lucky carrot to uh, as an employer brand, something for a employer branding, for example, because there are companies that look alike, you know, each other, and then or a candidate to become, you know, uh, an employee for them. Um, it's no kind of difference choosing between this kind of company or this kind of company, and Lucky Carrot gives like advantage to them to be for their employer branding, so that more candidates can come of it. To, um, to their company because the employer branding is about your promise to the employee. And with Lucky Carrot, your promise to employee is, dear employee, if you come to our company, you will be recognized and you'll be appreciated on a daily basis. And you're gonna have your short term rewards in form of gift cards, etc. We have engagement surveys. Um, uh, we will listen to your feedback. We will act on your feedback and we will track everything to understand whether what we have uh, done based on your feedback worked well or not. Another example to give you, uh, like, uh, as I've said, Lucky Carrot has its you know, uh, page with gift cards. So the companies that want to promote healthy lifestyle or let's say self-improvement inside the company, instead of gift cards of many, um, let's say, um, cafeterias, restaurants that uh, provide you know, fast food, they can replace these gift cards with those gift cards that, you know, let's say cafeteria that provides a healthy food or a gym membership card, an e-learning platform for self-improvement, right? The gift card is for promoting whatever you want at your company. And there are lots of other things that you can actually do with Lucky Carrot, very customizable. Like we are right now working with um, Philip Morris Armenia here in you know, local office. They had a project and they did it with Lucky Carrot. It's a, it was about a little bit of a recognition project and we developed a few things in lucky carrot which is very easy uh from a technical standpoint and we did it and they still still did it uh, within the system so yeah it's very very customizable and it's not regarding customizations there are not usually things that are very very hard that will take lots of months from us to do them are there a lot of benefits you notice with lucky carrot that can't really be measured that are still there. Uh, how much do you do you think that uh, the, using the culture shaping tool that is Lucky Carrot sort of leaves something intangible uh, to the to the companies, which is still real, but just hard to put in a spreadsheet? Mm, okay, so for example, um, very. Um, I'm gonna give you like a feedback that I received. The very yeah. very latest back from the company so again uh, it was a uh, local tech company around like um 17 employees right now or even more since they were hiring um again so th- this two um feedback that i'm going to give you those are more of a qualitative actually lucky carrot uh, has something in there within the analytics that shows you um who the key team players are in your company, who the best performance are, 
who the informal leaders are inside your company. And in this company, before using like a carrot, they had this uh, person that wanted to promote. And then they were they needed to understand whether this person has this kind of value that one is one of their core you know values inside the company. And then when they use Lucky Carrot, Lucky Carrot confirmed that this person has that value because inside Lucky Carrot, when people say thank you to each other, their feedback employees match with one of the uh, with one of the company core values. And this person got lots of carrots from top three values that this person needed to be promoted. And Lucky Carrot confirmed that. And then after the usage, it became you know um, it became clear. And then the person was you know promoted. Like a carrot also has to understand if you have new hires, are they being integrated in your team? Because like a carrot shows you real time mapping mm. of employee relationships and interactions. So if you hire someone, you can see whether this person is being integrated within his or her team very quickly or not. Can you is speak a bit that- more on this? How do you know if someone's integrated? Like you obviously know if you're there or if you're the person, but like how mm. do you explain this to someone else? Okay, so um, actually, it's um, very hard to say in words, but it's yeah. like a visual. It's like a mapping. Uh, it's like um, you know, employees. Like you have this, you know, circles with profiles, and then you have uh, the mapping of their interactions with lines coming uh, from people to people, and each which is again based on the peer to peer recognition. Okay. But again, all of that, all of the data that comes out of it, it comes from very, very, very simple input of data by your employees, peer-to-peer recognition, as simple as that. It shows you like the real picture uh, of the interactions that people are having because we have had um, cases when someone was had you know, weaker and thinner lines with, you know, coming uh, out of her to her team members. And then this person had uh, communication problems inside the company. And so you as an HR manager, when you see that, let's say someone has very strong uh, you know, relationships with others, and then there's relationships uh, for a few months later become weaker and weaker, before things get even worse, you can understand what's happening because you as an HR manager or you as a, let's say, team lead or as one of the senior management team members, you might not notice it because you are not sitting with them every time, every second like inside their office, right? You are not yeah. in their, say, if you're a tech, you are not in their standoffs. You are not in this or that, I don't know, reviews or whatever they do that in um, agile, uh, uh, in, in this agile, agile system or meetings and lucky so lucky carrot actually shows you according to that peer-to-peer recognition which is based on the number of recognitions we give to each other so it's like there's like a miscommunication problem or like a conflict we become less communicative we become we do recognitions less uh you know between each other and so we kind of become separated in this interactions okay That's before we before we end, I'm curious because since you said you've done you do surveys before you start out and and you've now created obviously this um, this system and this um, application for for companies, uh, what are some of the findings you've seen through your surveys that you know how good are companies actually at this employee engagement and what have been some of the are there some trends you can see where most companies still fail? I think this is something that could be really interesting for for anyone working in an HR role or, or management role. That what are some easy things or some pretty normal things that you could could improve that you found during your your service and and by mm-hmm. by implementing this app in many companies. Mm-hmm. So first of all, the engagement survey is in the form of a pulse survey, which means it comes to you as an employee like a Pulse, which means the uh, the frequency at which you need to answer to the survey questions is you know high. Um, usually it is you know two times a month, very very short, like ten questions, but very very deep questions, like which will take you like maximum two minutes. Uh, and inside you know like a care platform regarding the UI, whatever we have made it so that people can answer to the questions uh, because if everyone maybe very bold statement, but maybe everyone hates surveys. <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, but we do the surveys, uh, uh, you know, very, very fr- frequently with the employees to keep track 
Um, and like, it's very obvious when you do the survey, yeah, recognition, recognition is one of the key metrics of employee engagement. You see that recognition score is kind of low after using like a carrot, like two months later, it becomes absolutely high, that's for sure. And not just the uh, recognition frequency is important, but also the recognition quality is important. How qualified recognitions do your employees give inside the company on a daily basis? because that's how you help the HR managers make visible, to, uh, that's how you help the HR managers see what's happening inside the company, see the good stuff happening inside the company. And uh, usually, yeah, so the recognition goes up uh, in companies that are, how can I say, like we know, like in locally in Armenia, that you know people really love, like um, employees really love their company, like the ambassadorship, uh, which means how proud the employees are working at your company is usually high uh, is one of the key metrics. But what is usually low is the well-being. Well, and uh, sometimes satisfaction. I'm going to give you like two examples from it, from this. So there is a, a engagement metric that is called satisfaction, which is usually again low at, at companies. Satisfaction is about if uh, the employee has its basic needs to do the job. It's not only the compensation, like the salary, it's also about, do I have a laptop? Do I have a good laptop? Do I have a printer that I need? If I'm a support team member, do I have a, you know, good headphones working, whatever. And then in one of the companies, like, it's very, very funny. Satisfaction was very low. And then there is a question that asks uh, regarding the workplace comfort. Uh, like, does your, you know, workplace, you know, comfortable? And then you, they just uh, take it from, you know, one to five, from one to five scale. And like most of, like almost 100% of the answers were like one. And it's something very basic, but decreases your engagement. And you know what the reason was? The chairs were not comfortable. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, such a, such a simple thing. And then I, uh, I relate. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the chair is not comfortable. It causes, I don't know, maybe back pain, you get, you know, tired working and then you kind of change the chairs to find something comfortable you can. Uh, and it, uh, and it um, affects neg negatively on your work, uh, on your work daily. And so they change the chairs and then you track whether the satisfaction went up or not. And it went from like 2.2 to uh, like 3.5 in just a month, in just a month. And they just changed uh, half of the chairs and they were still changing them, buying new ones, right? And then the survey is not about just, you know, doing the survey and saying, yeah, I'm doing the engagement survey. So you are not, you need to see the, the problem, right? Okay, there's a satisfaction problem. What's happening? Go talk to your employees, right? Go talk to your employees to understand what's happening. Regarding the well-being, um, well-being is about how you as a company promote healthy lifestyle at your company. How you as a company plus uh, how your peers, not only the, you know, the company itself, but also the, how peers are promoting healthy lifestyle and healthy, you know, eating habits at your company. And one of the companies was very, very low and it was okay for them as a company because, yeah, they go to some group events, team building activities, and they go for beer. Having beer, of course, there shouldn't be any, you know, thought about well-being, which is okay for them because, uh, usually tech companies in Armenia, they love hanging out in group pubs and fr Friday nights, but they had some new, uh, you know, new generation coming into their companies. They had new hires and uh, around 20 people, which is, and then they started looking, oh my gosh, well-being is very low we need to think about this because we have this new hires from a new generation. You as a manager go to kitchen, you see these people and they are kind of talking about calories and you know what you can eat with this or you cannot eat with that. Uh, kind of healthy, uh, healthy food habits, you understand, no, this is something that right now I need to focus on, right? And then, for example, with Lucky Carrot, we are building these actionable recommendations, what you can do as an HR manager if your well-being metric is low. And so Lucky Carrot gives you an automatic recommendation, dear HR manager, go to the rewards section, this group event section of Lucky Carrot, create a group event with a gym membership card. Or a local, there is a local. There are several local uh, electric bike providers. Go and do team building with those. Go and do you know, some biking together. Maybe after the lunch or before the lunch or before the work starts, and then track whether the well-being uh, increase or not. 
Awesome. Yeah. Don't get rid of the Friday night brew pubs, though. That sounds <laughs> fun. <laughs> I think it's an imp- important part of well-being as well. Yes, But I have is. to say, uh, I think this sounds very exciting. It's very interesting. This, when it comes to lucky carrot, for example, you mentioned ambassadorship as as a key metric within Armenia mm-hmm. when it comes to sort of how to measure employee uh, engagement. Uh, and I'm, I'm I'm assuming that this is at least to some extent a sort of cultural artifact within Armenia that this is that high up in the priority list. So how much do you have to think about uh, sort of cultural differences or just like uh, temperamental differences, whatever it is, whatever label you want to put on it when you sort of internationalize, for example, or when you when you sort of uh, measure uh, employee engagement, uh, let's say Finland, for example, compared to Armenia. I don't think you've ever I don't think you've ever been here uh, so to sort of analyze the company cultures, but like how do you how would you approach it? Mm-hmm. So um, regarding uh, regarding Armenia, the thing is that uh, it uh, yes, of course, it depends on the culture, the culture in Armenia, the tech company culture, in Armenia, tech company culture in Finland or in uh, some other places. But there is something has to do with also the company size, because um, again, in Armenia, there are very few companies that have um, hundreds or thousands of employees, very few of them that you can just count on your fingers. Mostly the, the companies are, are, you know, 100 employees, 150, it can be like 200 or 50, whatever, um, you know, kind of small. Uh, and in Armenia, it's like very, very family, uh, you know, it's very, very family-like inside the company. And this is one of the things that really affects positively on the ambassadorship because in Armenia, mostly like when when uh, we are working with tech companies and very very familiar with our local tech companies and the culture inside them, is that uh, it doesn't matter who you are as a person. Like, are you someone that can be replaced very quickly? Or are you a junior or senior developer? It doesn't matter. Everyone is not everyone is treated like a very very close family member. Like a very very it's like a family culture. And but when you go to like very big company and this is why maybe the big companies you have this uh ping pong or a table tennis something to like kind of engage you make you feel like home right. but yeah, since yeah, you're yeah. in water a very cooler big, yeah i mean whatever there can be like lots of dozens of stuff that you can see right yeah. especially in like a big companies or in silicon valley culture-ish you know companies but it always boils down to the relationship you have employee with your colleagues with the senior management right it's two it's two way uh you know, relationships and if you are if you are working in a very big company you will be treated as another one most likely you will be treated as another one because when there is like a big company something great happens it's even very um you you can't even notice where does this good stuff come from Who did it? If, if it's a very big company, it becomes the picture becomes very blurry. You become another one that can be replaced uh, very quickly. But in smaller companies, and uh, in, in Armenia, there are you know again mostly you know mid-sized companies. You are treated like a family, and that's why we see companies having you know this uh, a metric of ambassadorship very high because it impacts your relationship with peers, your relationship with uh, the management. And you being treated as a family member, very close one, that can just sit in the kitchen and have some lunch with the CEO, then you become a great ambassador of your uh, company. Of course, there are many other factors, but these are the main ones. If I talk about, you know, culturally, this thing internationally, um, whether it be, I don't know, of uh, Finland or whether, whether it be, let's say, UK or Saudi Arabia, whatever, um, It depends on the company, what kind of culture there is. Like it's very, very individual, very individual, right? Ambassadorship indirectly can be um, affected through your brand name. If you just went to the company just because the brand name is good and you will say, yeah, I work in this place, you know, you say the name and, you, you know, this is how, you, yeah, you can generate your pride in it. But if it's only the brand name, You can increase your ambassadorship a little bit, but if it's the brand name, but you don't have, you are just treated another one as an employee inside the company. Yeah, inside you will be, you know, there, you know, having not that much pride in your company. Yes, fascinating. I I want to, unless you have something on the topic, William, please interject, because otherwise I'm going to ask a completely different kind of question. <laughs> please do. Okay, so Miriam, 
Uh, we spoke a bit before this episode a few days ago, and, and we just randomly started talking about our studies. You asked me what I'm doing. I'm studying for my master's here in Copenhagen, and, and you, you mentioned that you'd, you'd studied for your bachelor's. And now this is your opportunity to tell all the kids to not go to school, if you want so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, stay out no, of school. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> it, like, just your sort of... Uh, story of, of like how how do you see the role of formal education uh, sort of uh, as 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 an entrepreneur like how has it helped you has it and and what's your sort of personality like because I mean this is this is kind of a new thing though we've been talking about this topic and this is being widely talked about just the role mm-hmm. of formal education in society and, and and stuff like this so what are your own thoughts about your own experience when it comes to this equation sure um when um no, in Armenia, there is this uh, culture, which I hate it. Um, I really don't like that. Um, it's not uh, something that I think is done internationally or in some, you know, places or maybe even the U.S. I'm not sure. But we have this, uh, let's say, labels that we give to um, kids when they go to school. If you're in, you know, the same like an A student or at a C student or a B student, right? Uh, and maybe I can say, yeah, unfortunately, I have been an A plus student for like 10 years uh, in my school, you know, in the middle school before going to high school. And I had like, um, you know, when you are when you are an A plus or A student uh, along the way, you know, from, from the first grade uh, until you go to high school, uh, graduate in middle school, go to high school, you get a red diploma. So I got, I got the red diploma. I was doing really good in all of the subjects in all of them. Um, but then when, uh, I, then after that, and then in high school, this is when I started, uh, not really uh, attending the classes as, uh, in the same way, not really, um, and the, the, the transition of, you know, having this brownie point and being an A plus student to not being an A plus student in, in my case was very, very smooth. And it was not the tragic for me. Oh my God, I have studied so long in this, you know, very, very well. How can I not study very well along the way? Um, because I understood that what the all of that time, which did not actually compromise or compensate, which did not compensate my social life, not at all. But still, I would invest most of the time on the studies uh, that I could just not study those classes and some other things. But still, yeah. Uh, and then when I went to high school, I just uh, prepared for yeah university, whatever. In the university, uh, during the very first year, I was very active. I'm very very active. You know, you know, different clubs, you know, studies, everything. So I kind of managed to do everything. And after that, my learning curve went like this, starting from my second year till my fourth year, till my graduation because I was like saturated and I could not, you know, sit there and lectures. I could not listen to the lectures. I started um, working on, um, you know, company or then, then I started working on my startup during all of my lectures. I just had my laptop open or my phone uh, and my smartphone, just doing some work there and not really listening to the lectures and hating doing this preparations round for exam because you prepare usually for the exam just a few hours or a few days before the exam, right? So um, I did not gain lots of things after my first year at the university, not at all. One thing that I can mention that I gained, uh, and it's kind of very funny, is the network. (laughs) Why? Because- Yes, okay. Yeah, because uh, in our university, uh, because for example, the very, you know, the very first class that I had was intro introduction to business, and uh, the lecturer was one of the founders of local Armenian company, right? So you get this network, which is very, very easily accessible. It's kind of funny. You give lots of money for the network, <laughs> which you can do just on the Facebook or LinkedIn. Um, so yeah, now that's my experience. And then of course, yeah, I did not go to masters. I think it's uh, first of all. Um, Going to masters after the bachelor's, I, I have just some very, you know, uh, controversial ideas on it. It's like, no, you need to have some experience, work experience and go to masters. Some say no. I mean, I don't know. I don't care because I don't want to go to masters because I just hate sitting there and listening to lectures. I still think that, well, if I need, I will go there if I just mm-hmm. exactly know I need this, right? But if 
right now I don't feel the need because your self-improvement comes from the internet. Hopefully you got lots of information there. And second of all, there are other paid services that you can take to um, do your you know, self-improvement. And I think being an entrepreneur actually helps you um, in your maybe number one goal. And in my case, in my number one goal as a person, which is about growth, because you tackle lots of things in, in entrepreneurship, right? It can be, the, you know, in every direction. It is, it, it is the sales, it is the uh, marketing, it is the financials, it is, you know, accounting, you know, in, investment is about exactly networking, um, whatever. Right. And uh, none of my studies regarding, you know, marketing or sales or whatever, or, you know, management, I mean, it never even overlapped with what is happening in the world in reality. I mean, I, mm. I don't really know about the international universities. I can say nothing about them, but uh, universities, I'm sure they do not really pre prepare for you to just, you know, be there. I mean, internship prepares internship definitely prepares because you get into the job market and you just kind of understand what is happening in reality in the world, not just theoretically, because theoretically everything looks very fine and easy, but in reality it's not. So I think, yeah, the universities do not really prepare for the real life and they should. That's fascinating. As someone who is studying for a master's and I, I like some, somehow I feel at home to an extent in the like in academia, I really like that there are now uh, different opportunities for different people. So that there's not just one path that you can follow. Mm -hmm. I really, I'm really very sort of, I'm very encouraged to hear that. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, glad, think, glad to hear. Yeah. And it's a great way, you know, to, yeah, if you try, try to get everyone or every, every person to go through the same routines or same system, you're going to, eventually rule out quite a lot of interesting you know talents and people along the way so there are absolutely. people who absolutely benefit from academia and there are people who are not maybe suited to that or created for that or or just would flourish much better at in some other environment and i think it's it's good that it's it's being discussed as you said because um absolutely this is something that many entrepreneurs talk about and doesn't categorically mean that you know going to university is bad for entrepreneurship i don't think there's like this this kind of correlation it's just about you know you can learn entrepreneurship uh also outside of school probably better <laughs> outside of school than don't you know that you school, can't so. be bill gates unless you drop out yeah okay that's a, like a law of nature or something yeah <laughs> but otherwise <laughs> if you don't want to be bill gates just you know, but yeah, I think it's a good good thing to challenge that assumption also, and and um, realize that it's not as black and white black and white question, you know, as yeah. uh, it's sometimes made out to be. But uh, yeah, uh, I mean, it's been a big pleasure uh, talking to you, Mariam, and uh, yes. I'm I'm at least personally very excited about Lucky Carrot and and uh, gonna follow your journey, and hope you come to Finland at some point as well. Let us know. Uh, we'll we'll try to help you out in any way we can and, and maybe implement this also with our little podcast team of, of five people so we can have virtual and real carrots uh, handed out here. Uh, but yeah, um, great talking to you. Thank great you so much. You. It was also my pleasure to be your guest for the very first time. I'm, I'm, it was very, very interesting uh, conversation and really thank you for, for your questions and for this time. I really enjoyed myself too. Great to hear that. And uh, thank you. Yeah, for anyone. Thanks, William. Uh, thank you, Isaac. And thank you to everyone who listened and, and viewed the video. Uh, if you like Soaked by Slush, please follow us on Twitter or any social media that you prefer. And do subscribe to the show so you get notified of any new episodes that will come out every Thursday from now on. Stay tuned. And thank you. Stay safe. See you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank bye bye. You. Bye bye.